Coming up on the next Situation Report, we're here in Belgium as we honor the American men and women who fought and died here during World War I and World War II. It's all coming up on the next Sit Rep. Situation Report, Liberating Belgium, Remembering America's Sacrifice, is made possible by contributions from UNCTV, Public Media North Carolina members, and by the generous support of Louise Bennett. This program was produced by UNCTV, Public Media North Carolina, in partnership with the American Battle Monuments Foundation, the American Overseas Memorial Day Association Belgium, Visit Flanders, and the Wallonia Tourism Bureau. Hello and welcome to this very special Situation Report from Belgium. I'm Jeff Smith. Today we're talking about how the citizens of Belgium are honoring and celebrating the memory of those American soldiers who fought and died in World War I and World War II here. The Kingdom of Belgium became a sovereign state in 1830 after separating from the Netherlands. Now Belgium is home to 11.4 million people. The country is made up of the capital city of Brussels and two main regions, Flanders in the north and Walloon in the south. As a current leader in standard of living, quality of life and education in Europe, it's hard to believe that for the first half of the 20th century, Belgium was in the center of two world wars. When Germany invaded Belgium in 1914 on its push towards France to start the First World War, the people of Belgium were directly in the path. The first few months of the war were known as the Rape of Belgium, as Germany consumed everything they could from the Belgian people, killing a large number of civilians along their path. At first, the United States remained neutral and did not enter the war. Many Americans decided to join the fight and left the U.S. to join the armies of Canada, France, and Great Britain. When the United States officially declared war on Germany on April 6, 1917, the battle had been dragging on across Europe for three years, mainly made up of trench warfare. One unit of fighters from the 27th and 30th Infantry Divisions fought its way through Belgium into the Flanders region and pushed back the Germans at Kimmel. The 27th was made up of guardsmen from New York and the 30th Infantry Division was known as the Old Hickory Unit and were comprised of National Guardsmen from Tennessee, South Carolina and North Carolina. This monument is erected on the exact spot of the battlefield. Over 2,000 men died uh, over the space of just a few short weeks on this battlefield and so this is, this is a sacred ground. Thank you all for your presence here today in Heuveland at this memorial who commemorates the first attack by American troops in Belgium. What's touching to me though is the way that the Belgian communities are involved in these kind of memorials. What we saw today is we memorialized the U.S. Army and servicemen who, who died right here where we stand uh, was the involvement of 11 and 12 year old Belgian children. Wesley Jackson was born on a farm near Hillsboro. North Carolina on the 50th of March, 1887. Wesley wrote more than 25 letters to his wife and little girl. The contents revealed his eagerness to get back home. And when that little girl started reading the story of a, of a young man from Hillsborough, North Carolina, it's pretty touching. It brings things home. Wesley wrote his last letter on the 26th of August, a few days before he was killed in action. It was if he had a premonition that this was going to be his farewell letter. To his daughter he wrote, be a good girl, and if I never see you and marry anymore in this life, I hope to meet you in a better place. That story represents, you know, probably 2,000 more stories just like it about young American men who are willing to commit themselves uh, to, uh, to a life of service uh, and to, to serve uh, in a circumstance, uh, as, as you heard in that one letter, whether it was premonition or whether he just knew that he was in for a tough fight, he knew what was at stake and he was willing to get up and go from, from trench to trench and fighting hole from fighting hole, uh, doing the dirty business that infantrymen do. And at the end of the day, the, uh, we were successful and some didn't make it back. Many of the men who died on the battlefields of Belgium were returned to the United States at the government's expense. 
Other families requested that their loved one remain at rest in a U.S. military cemetery overseas, created and maintained by the American Battle Monuments Commission since 1923. That same year saw the birth of the American Overseas Memorial Day Association in Belgium, a private public partnership between the American Battle Monuments Commission, the United States Embassy to the Kingdom of Belgium, the U.S. and Belgian militaries, and the AOMDA Foundation. Talk about the experience of being with the people to walk in, including yourself, walking through those gates, coming in here to the field. Well, the, the one thing you have to understand when you first walk into the cemetery is, when I give a lot of tours, and a lot of them are Americans that come from the United States and they come visit, is they, they view the cemetery as hollowed ground because American war dead are buried here. And I explained to them that this ground was made hollowed before they were buried here, because this was a battlefield before it became a cemetery. So the troops from the 91st Division actually came through here and engaged the enemy, fought and died. And so a lot of the soldiers buried here died here. And so when you understand that sentiment, so when you walk into the cemetery, it, it takes on a different feeling because it's more than just a cemetery. I mean, it's like, it's like, like Gettysburg National Cemetery. It's a battlefield cemetery. So, so that's one of the important things you have to remember when you come into the cemetery. As you look through the cemetery, the, the, the different sections of, of the cemetery where the, the stones are, and then you have the names as well. Talk about the beauty that is part of this as well. Because we are the smallest cemetery in the agency, they, they really had not much space to design a cemetery, so they tried to maximize what they had, and by doing so, by subdividing into the four plots with a chapel in the very center, and that's the focus of it, because if you look at the cemetery, all four plots face the chapel. And so it, it makes it a little bit more intimate when you come to this cemetery. So you go visit the other cemeteries, our largest ones, the Muse Argonne American Cemetery, over 14,000 soldiers buried there, and sometimes you get lost in the sea of white headstones and a lot of people don't realize that people are actually buried there because they're overwhelmed by the number. But when you tell them they're buried there, and it's, it's, then it really hits them. But when you come to visit this cemetery, and then you, it's easier to comprehend that for every headstone, the name you read is the person who's buried there. And so it's not very big, so you're able to walk within all the plots and almost get to know all these soldiers in a short amount of time because of its intimacy. And we see around us the flowers that are fresh right now. Uh, we've had the Memorial Day Remembrance here mm -hmm. uh, recently. And what is that like for someone if they want to come in and honor the soldiers during Memorial Day in the future as well? Well, the Memorial Day ceremony here has been a long-standing tradition. Um, for example, the, the American Battle Monuments Commission was created by Congress in March of 1923. The following May, for the Memorial Day ceremony here at the cemetery, was the first time the local school children came to sing and they sang both the Belgian and the American national anthems, and they still do that today. They do more, more than just sing. They come to the cemetery, they research the soldiers, they learn their history, and they also adopt a lot of the graves. So when you walk around the cemetery and you see a lot of the flowers, most of them are from the local people who are adopters. And so when we hold our annual Memorial Day ceremony, it's a lot more special because we really have the local community that, that participates and honor our soldiers as they should. For those Americans who joined other countries' armies and navies before the U.S. entered the war, their bodies were often buried in national cemeteries for those other countries or at private cemeteries across Belgium. Now the American Overseas Memorial Day Association in Belgium works to locate these grave sites and holds memorials each year at these hidden grave sites as well. Every soldier is memorialized with their story of military service by Dr. Jerry Sheridan of AMDA Belgium. Now I know in your research you've been able to find one North Carolinian who did not have the uniform on at the time. Uh, when he was killed in action during World War I. He's buried here in this cemetery. Talk about uh, how that came about and, and how, why he's here. Well, by way of a disclaimer at the beginning, the records from the First World War are not what they are from the Second World War. So the facts that we know about the individuals are rather few and far between. But we were able to determine the following. I mean, his name is Joseph Murdoch Lofton. 
and he was born in Kenansville, North Carolina. His father was named Island, his mother was named Annie Elizabeth. He had two brothers and he had two sisters, and he married a Daisy McIntyre. That's stuff we know. We actually know the date of his marriage. He, de he married her on the 26th of December, 1901. We know that uh, Joseph worked as a hospital orderly before the war, and he apparently spent some time in the United States Army. The British enlistment, the Canadian enlistment record shows that he belonged to the United States Army before, but we don't know if that means that he belonged to the North Carolina National Guard or if he actually joined the U.S. Army. But he certainly was not in the Army in 1915, and that's when he took the fateful decision to go north to Canada and join the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, the Canadians assigned him to the Medical Corps because he was a hospital orderly, and he was actually doing his duty right over there at the Remy Siding uh, Aid Station. It was the active duty hospital at the time period. And um, he, you know, people died in war for a variety of reasons, and one day he was out on a pass, uh, actually in France, just over the border, and managed to get himself struck by a train and died. We, they estimate that he was about 40 or 41 years old. So not one of the young guys that was uh, no, the typical the infantry. No, exactly, exactly. He joined late in life. Clearly, he, he believed in the cause, and, uh, or at least wanted it. Given that he was a hospital orderly, if we're in the world of speculation now, it would not be out of question that he saw the pick stories of people suffering and decided he wanted to do something about it. Many hidden graves are maintained by family members of the soldiers. They also honor their memory each year. This, this is the, the home of Octav, and the stables are untouched. So there, was, there hasn't been any change in, in, over all these years. Today we are here to honor Octav de Smet. When he was 22 years old, he decided that he wanted to emigrate to the United States of America. So he went across the ocean and settled down in Michigan and got a job in Michigan with a flower hander for the Sault Ste. Marie Railroad Company. By all accounts, he had intended to make this a permanent move. There was no indication he intended to come back to Belgium. Uh, but World War I broke out. When America entered the war, they instituted the draft. He was one of the first class of people to register for the draft, and he was drafted in June of 1918 into the American Army. This, this was uh, like uh, six contingents. Honor man, I could call it April 29, 1918. Okay. In August of, of, of uh, 1918, he, he was sent here to Europe. He was assigned to the 4th Infantry Regiment, which was heavily engaged in the combat in the Meuse Argonne region of France. Basically, his, his unit saw continuous combat from the 21st of September to the 1st of November 1918 in the Meuse Argonne, and they suffered 80%, 80% casualties in that period. Uh, this number so shocked the French that the French government awarded the entire regiment the Croix de la Guerre afterwards. Octave de Smet was one of these people who was killed in that period of time. He died on the 23rd of October 1918, uh, suffered of wounds uh, received during an artillery barrage. The willingness to put their, literally put, put his life on the line for his country and both his, uh, his uh, native born country of Belgium and then also to fight for uh, the U.S., uh, knowing that, you know, the odds could, could be against them. He... It's important for me for the next generation. That's why I wanted the, the schools to be here, the, the, the youth, because nobody knows anymore what it is to have famine, to have hunger, to have war. We're here to honor Raymond Topsommer. He was uh, an inhabitant of our city who uh, migrated to uh, the Americas in 1910. And he felt it as his duty to join the American forces. Uh, and he uh, died in, uh, in France. Uh, he was uh, buried first there and he was brought to Deense because his, uh, his mates uh, uh, remembered that he was from Deense. So he's buried here at a few yards away from the place where he lived as a, as a young man. How do you find these graves, especially the hidden graves that aren't at the main cemetery? How do you find where they're at? Well, when, when we first began on this quest, uh, the U.S. government had some records of some of these graves, and that's where we started. But once we got underway, um, you know, we found all the ones that the U.S. government knew about. But individual people, when they learn about our activities, come forward and tell us about new graves as they are, as they are quote unquote, discovered. So just in the last year, for example, we learned of two new isolated graves, and we had ceremonies for them this time, uh, this Memorial Day weekend. It's amazing the amount of uh, observance that comes with us this is not just your townspeople or even the family, 
their dignitaries are coming to these as well. This is a big, everyone's wanting to pay their respects to these soldiers. Th this is an important um, moment in Belgian-American relations each year. It's what, what brings together the, the people at a, at a very, at the level of the citizens, you point out, the level of the local communities, the level of the local mayors. And the, the U.S. Embassy values this, the U.S. military values this. Uh, it, it is important that we, that we reach out to the local communities and, and have this contact. And these isolated graves provide us an opportunity for um, talking about the Belgian-American relationship, um, centering it around the life of, of an individual that gave their life for the defense of Belgium. As the Great War concluded in 1918, Belgium returned to peace. But it would not be long before the world around them would explode again with violence and war. When Germany invaded Poland on September 1, 1939, France and Great Britain declared war on Germany and once again, Belgium was caught in the middle. Belgium tried to defend itself but was no match for the German military. Unlike what happened in the First World War, this time Belgium was forced to surrender. When the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor in 1941, the U.S. entered the war. Thousands of Americans came to Europe to liberate the continent from the Nazi regime. Nearly 14,000 Americans who died in the Second World War are buried in Belgium. Some of them are buried in isolated graves, like Bobby Garrett, who was born and raised in Norman, Oklahoma, and is buried in the cemetery of the village of Coup de Bois. In Coup de Bois, where we are living, there is also a ceremony with a, a military detachment, and that for the American pilot Robert Lee Garrett. I was army pilot in Belgium. And that's, that's the reason why I honor Bobby Garrett a few times a year by visiting his grave. Doing so is Bobby not too alone in our cemetery far away from America. What was your relationship with the U.S.? Très bien, très bon, très bon. C'était né parce que disons que euh, dans le sud de la Belgique a été libéré par les unités américaines. Donc mes grands-parents ont été libérés par les unités américaines. Et chez mes grands-parents, il y avait un militaire américain qui logeait là-bas parce que Yeesh avait beaucoup d'Américains là. Il a une très bonne relation. Le sud de la Belgique a été libéré par les Américains. Le village où ses parents vivaient a été libéré par les Américains et il a actually had an American living. Sa famille a hosté un American serviceman dans son home quand ils étaient là. Pour votre famille, merci beaucoup pour soutenir nous comme Américains ici. Elle a dit merci beaucoup pour votre soutien à notre cérémonie et les choses que nous faisons ici. Mais c'est moi très honoré d'être présent et de pouvoir remercier un soldat américain qui a donné sa vie pour nous. Il a dit que c'est son honneur d'être présent ici parmi nous et de donner un hommage à un soldat américain qui a été enterré ici. Comme la poussée a continué à libérer les pays européens de la guerre de libre de l'Europe de contrôle, les alliés soldats qui avaient le contrôle de la ville de Estone ont pris le contrôle de la ville de Estone held their ground and eventually pushed their way east to Germany in the Battle of the Bulge. Here in Bastogne, actually, the Battle of the Bulge happened 75 years ago. And uh, every day um, we learn about new stories of people involved here. But above all, what we want here is to preserve the memory of all the soldiers who fought uh, for our freedom in, in Europe. There was just one uh, small town uh, still holding on American hands, it was Bastogne. It was getting important also uh, for Hitler after that, when Hitler realized that he couldn't reach uh, Antwerp, which, which was the, the main objective of the German offensive. Uh, Hitler decided to take Bastogne at all costs just to get a, a political victory, I mean a symbolic victory also. This remembrance site in the, the new museum, the Western World Museum, you can discover the Battle of the Bulge, but in the general context of World War II. 
So it's very important for us to, uh, to explain to the visitors uh, what happened here in Bastogne especially and in the whole area and the whole region, but why also and in which context it, it took place. So you can discover many artifacts, uh, you can discover some vehicles, tanks, uh, but also stories. Uh, testimonies of witnesses, of uh, veterans. We think that it is important for the youngest generation to learn and to know what happened and why it happened because we know that uh, people can keep voting for uh, extremist parties and that you know you should never take peace for granted. That's what we say here. Uh, throughout the towns and countryside of Belgium there are many monuments that are dedicated to the fallen soldiers throughout World War I and World War II. Here is one that is dedicated to 11 African-American soldiers who were captured and massacred by the Germans in 1944. On December 17, 1944, the 333rd Field Artillery Battalion was overrun by the German army at St. Vith, Belgium, near the German border. During the capture, an American aircraft attempted to attack the German troops. In the confusion of the attack, 11 of the men escaped into the woods and fled to the north to attempt to find the American lines. The 11 African-American soldiers made it to the village of Werth, where they looked to escape the harsh winter conditions. A farmer named Matthias Langer agreed to help shelter them. In the village, German SS were tipped off about the hiding American soldiers and quickly captured the 11 men. The SS led the men to a ditch where they tortured and brutally murdered them. Now this monument marks their horrific story. Throughout our journey here in Belgium, we found many monuments and stories of American soldiers. One of the interesting ones here uh, is with this house here. Uh, during World War II, right before the Battle of the Bulge, the American soldiers actually came and stayed here at this house. There were hundreds of them. In fact, they stayed out in tents in the fields. And then when they went off to the battles, they actually left a lot of artifacts behind because they didn't want to take them into the battle. So Mr. Smith, who was a young boy at the time, collected them and kept them. And now there's a museum honoring the soldiers who fought in World War II. Uh, my husband, he was a little boy during World War II and he became German. So uh, and he was German for more than four years and then liberated on 9-11-44. We had not enough food here. And when the American came to give a chocolate, give a candy, we had more, no more candy for four years and the American it was very nice. <laughs> they moved the 305th from the 8th Air Force to St. Tron, Belgium, which was in the 9th Air Force. And that is actually where I spent the rest of my military career. I took quite a few tours, and one of them included a visit to Marcel and Matilda's uh, museum. The veterans don't tell stories to their families, they tell it here, it's easier here because they fought here. And we understand the suffering and what they went through. Because some veterans told me in America they would not believe us. So they didn't tell so much. They tell more here when they come back. I, I remember uh, when the American made the cemetery in Harry Chapel, I see the truck full of body came uh, to burn it to the cemetery. I can never forget. It's just not covered. And you see two lines on the road, red, red line with the blood. The, these soldiers, I can never forget this. They're great people, as you found out, and have done a tremendous amount of activity in connection with uh, those of us who fought in that battle. For me, these men are from the greatest generation and they came old, they were drafted, most of them, so there was no choice, 18 years old. And I think what they all, they did their duty. And I think our duty is at least to remember. So that's what we do with our museum. And the name of the museum is Remember Museum. We try to keep their memory alive. As long as we are around, we will do that. It's our duty. Like the First World War, this conflict took many lives. Of the over 16 million U.S. soldiers who served in the war, 407,316 were killed around the globe. Roughly 88,000 civilians were killed in the war. Around 6,000 Belgian soldiers were killed during the early invasion period. For the fallen whose families wished for their remains to be with their fellow soldiers near where they died in battle, 
there are two U.S. cemeteries, Ardennes American Cemetery and Henri Chapelle American Cemetery. Both are operated and maintained by the American Battle Monuments Foundation. My name is Andre Jamal, second lieutenant of the First Army. Uh, I was with the 77 Evacuation Hospital uh, in December 1944 during the Battle of the Delhi, as you know. Actually, I was here, you know, uh, in, uh, in September, and the American troops came over, and since I speak English and, and, and French and German, uh, I joined the troops immediately and was, you know, I got, I, I got a commission of uh, second lieutenant and, and this until the end of the war. Well, this is, a, this is memory for me, you know. I was just writing, I'm thinking about all my friends who were with my unit with me. And fortunately, none of them is here, which is good. But very emotional. As a matter of fact, I always keep my, you know, I had my sunglasses here because I, I almost cried. That's it. An old man crying. Well, this is, originally was a temporary cemetery where you, where you had um, 17,000 Americans buried here, um, so it was, a, it, yeah, it was a battlefield cemetery. We also had 10,000 Germans buried here because um, we're so close to Germany. We're literally 20 minutes from, uh, from Aachen. Um, so all the war dead that liberated Belgium and also the war dead from the Battle of Aachen, Hurken Force, Battle of the Bulge, um, anywhere where the First Army fought, most of them were buried here. How has the cemetery then changed? I guess you've changed it around, make it more uh, specific American. You've had some people have been sent back to America. Right. Uh, after the war, we disinterred the Germans, the 10,000 Germans. They were moved to a German war cemetery in, in, in Belgium as well, Lomo German Cemetery. And then the 17,000 Americans, the families had the choice. Around 1947, the uh, War Department sent letters to the families for them to make the final decision whether to keep their loved ones here or sent back to their home of record um, to be buried in a private cemetery or a national cemetery. What's amazing to me is when I come to the ceremony that you have for Memorial Day weekend here, you learn about so many of the individual people who were buried here, their stories, the, the heroism that came along with that. How does that you know, make you feel you're really standing guard for them now. We have a soldier file on, on each of the soldiers either memorialized on the wall of the missing or actually buried here. A lot of times we're lucky because the families share pictures, stories of the soldiers. Sometimes we, oftentimes in the winter when it's a little bit slower, we grab the archives and we scour the internet or buy books and we do a little bit of research so we sometimes read a passage about a soldier so we'll make a copy of that. The goal, and it, it, this, this has been going on even before I was here, uh, but the goal is to have a picture and a, and a story behind every headstone. When you walk on these grounds each day for work, you look out across that field of all the crosses and stars, what does that do for you? I, that's why I worked. Uh, that's why I took this job. Um, just recently with Memorial Day, I always say my favorite day is the Monday of Memorial Day because we have to work that day. Um, and my favorite part is in the morning I'm putting the flag up because it's usually just me and almost the 8,000 headstones. Um, I've never met these guys, uh, but I feel like they are my brothers in a sense. Um, so, and I hate to use this term because you know I was in the Navy, but it's not just a job, it's an adventure almost. And it's not an adventure in, in, in the same sense of being in the Navy, but yeah, there's a sense of, uh, Especially when you receive family members or when you do research on some of these soldiers, you, you, you feel close to them, even though they, they left us 75 years ago. Um, it's still relevant today. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, sometimes I do still pinch myself and, uh, and, and sometimes not realize you know, how lucky I am to be overlooking this site and being responsible for, the, uh, for not only the site itself, but the, the legacy that these guys left.
Why is it important for both Americans and Belgians to remember those who fought and died? Well, you start back with our relationship with Belgium. We were the first country to recognize Belgium back in 1830, and we've had a relationship ever since. We've got a long-standing transatlantic relationship that I just mentioned. Uh, it's very close. We fight together in Afghanistan. We fight together in Iraq. Uh, we work together in the Balkans. And the reason for it is that we protect each other. We protect each other through our multilateral arrangement with NATO. We protect each other uh, through other activities as well. We're in the UN together. Uh, we're in a variety of other multilateral organizations together. And people need to understand that. And this is the basis on which we build that relationship. Having come here, both for the First and Second World War, fought and died with our Belgian brothers, it's, it's important that we remember, that we revere, and that we don't forget. Not every day do we have all these people here in the chairs here, but what is it like when you do step on these grounds each time for you personally? I, I can't tell you. I, I've spent half a day here more than once just contemplating the sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice that so many Americans have made so that we, you and I and the rest of the Americans can be free. It should, think about that, how important that is. The support of democracy that these individuals made, they made the ultimate sacrifice, something that you and I will never be called on to do. How have you seen the celebration for Americans coming over and understanding this as well? They, they make, some of them make the trip, the families still make the trip uh, every so often to come visit these on these Memorial Days. You can almost not come here any day of the year and not meet a family member who remembers. Uh, it's very frequently we have congressional delegations come here. They want to come to this cemetery, they want to come to the other cemetery here in the Ardennes. They want to go see our first World War Cemetery because, first of all, they remember, they studied their history, but also so many of them have relatives that fought and in many cases died here. There's a, a senator from Wyoming that carries his father's dog tags with him everywhere he travels. When he came, when he was in Brussels last, he came here. I mean, it's Speaker of the House Pelosi, her uncle, died not too far from here during the Battle of the Bulge. A lot of history here. A lot of history and it touched a lot of families. That's what we forget about, how many families were touched. The Battle of the Bulge, again, that was fought just a few miles from here, uh, 90,000 casualties, 20,000 dead Americans. It was the biggest battle that was fought by Americans during the Second World War. And uh, so many families were touched. While it's up to the cemetery staff to maintain the landscape and headstone beauty, volunteers, who are called sentinels, adopt grave sites to keep the memory of the fallen soldiers alive. I have adopted this grave many years ago when I was a kid. I have always, always been raised uh, in respect of the veterans. This was something very important in our family. So for me, it's really normal to have adopted this tomb, this grave, and I have also other five other graves here on the cemetery. So it's, I think it's a common practice in Belgium for people uh, just to adopt graves in uh, American cemeteries. His plane was hit around Brussels, uh, coming back from a mission uh, in Germany. And the plane crashed uh, in Antwerp, in the northern part of Belgium. Uh, it seems that the, um, the pilot tried to have all his men uh, bailed out of the, of the plane. And we don't know what happened with Leroy. Uh, we don't know if he was hit and he couldn't, if he was injured and couldn't open his parachute, or if the parachute didn't open. So he was just found, uh, his body was found uh, in a field near a little uh, village near Antwerp. People all over Belgium remember the Americans buried in this country. This includes Linda Klaus of the Hippo War Museum in Wargum. There, the story of the American army in Belgium during World War I is told. And I think it's important that we know that those boys, in fact, they were boys, most of them, and gave their lives for us. So I remember when I adopted a grave, um, the soldier was as old as my youngest son at that moment when he died. So um, that moves you uh, when you think about it. Whose grave did you adopt? You Ernest Arnold Solmville, and that's his name. He was an ordinary boy, um, but uh, he had already experienced a very bad um, 
part in his life. His wife died when she was very young, and they had a little boy. And uh, when the little boy was um, four years old, he had to register for the army. And he thought, well, as I'm a widower, perhaps I won't have to go. Um, but uh, that was no excuse, uh, and he died here uh, in a gas attack. He stayed at her house. He stayed, when is he going to be here? A de jours. So he stayed about 15, 15 yeah, days. Yeah, fortnight. Yeah. Um, and then they got called up near um, in December. They got called up for the, the Battle of the Bulge. Um, so he shipped out. And you have received the news a month later? Vous avez reçu les nouvelles de qu'il a, qu a Oui, tombé ses un, compagnons, un mois ses frères d'armes sont revenus chez un, nous. Un mois on plus dit, tard. Oui, je crois. Un mois plus tard, yeah. ils sont revenus. So she's saying that about a month later after he left, his his uh, brothers in arms came back to the house to let them know that he had, he had, uh, he had been killed in action. Des histoires qui viennent surtout à la bataille des Ardennes. She's adopted or been of memory for nine graves, and the majority of them are from the Battle of the Bulge. You're one of the one, one of the people here who take care of keeping the memory alive of these soldiers. Talk about uh, Mr. Murphy here. Yeah, here I wanted to take care of um, uh, the grave of uh, Sergeant Murphy because uh, this is a very sad case. Uh, he was killed in October 1944 uh, while uh, setting uh, anti-personnel mine killed by his own mine. She came here in 1946 uh, when the cemetery was open to the public, when we still had wooden crosses. Um, so she has been visiting his grave since 1946. And she came here for Memorial Day, the first Memorial Day in 1946, where General Eisenhower was uh, the guest speaker. Behind those crosses, you have people. And when you imagine that instead of having crosses, you would have people, it's, you know, it's really terrible. And I think that we need to do everything we can to, to avoid the war and uh, just to avoid people coming in and, and died for us. Parce qu'il faut jamais oublier que s'il si n'était pas là. Where she lives, because uh, parts of Belgium around here were annexed to Germany. So a lot of Belgians were under not only German occupation, but some of them actually became German citizens although they didn't want to be, so they know that uh, without the Americans they would be Germans today. They would be uh, you know, under, under the, uh, the regime of uh, Nazi Germany. Why do you do this? Why do you continue to, to look after all of the ones you've adopted? But well, I'm born in 1962. In 1962, all the people, my family, parents and grandparents, leave the World War II. At Every family reunion, every family reunion, they finally talk about the war. Uh, my grandparents were in the Belgian army. They, after they talk about their liberation war from the American soldier in September 44. And I think since the very beginning, it was fixed, like for jean philippe the same, fixed here. And uh, so when I had the opportunity, when I met jean philippe when I was 17 years old, and when he told me that, he was searching the battlefield and finding equipment. I directly jumped in. I mean, I haven't, I wasn't born during the war, but when you see all those crosses here and all over Europe, it's, uh, it's very moving, I would say. A lot of families have told her that she is the connection between the headstone and the family. Mm. C'est bien. To honor the fallen, Dr. Sheridan takes his students from American University on a walking tour of the wars in Belgium. So what happened in World War I is they dug trenches. They went deep, so you're beneath the machine guns, you're beneath all this other sort of thing. So technology had to overcome that, and technology overcame that through the invention of things like tanks, which could roll over the top of trenches. You get to World War II, okay, the strategy and tactics have adapted, but the weapons are equally as dangerous as they were before. So what the men did to provide themselves shelter was they, again, dug into the ground, but they knew they weren't going to be there for weeks or months at a time like they were in the First World War. So they dug what were called foxholes, 
which were kind of shallow holes in the ground that would protect you from, you know, surface fire coming at you. And if you covered the top of the foxhole, it could protect you from artillery shells and everything coming in. All right. So what you see here is the 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 um, what's left over of what had originally been a foxhole of Easy Company. This entire forest was filled with these these foxholes. All right, and you can also see a couple of other examples. Just look at where the, the, the ground indents a little bit. And why aren't the foxholes there anymore? Well, it rains and snows a lot. Obviously, they cave in over years, but, but you can tell by the indentations where these foxholes were originally. Each footstep is a step back in time. Here, we actually get to visit a lot of the places where a lot of fighting actually happened, where people actually died on this soil. Whereas in the, in the United States, we're more separated from that because that stuff didn't happen so recently. Weathered ground reflects the history of fighting. Each memory, a lesson in sacrifice. When you visit an American military cemetery, all of the graves are marked by either a cross or a Star of David, as you see right here. A Star of David, for those of the Jewish faith, cross for all others. Everything else was, was, was buried under a cross, all right? This scene behind me was originally the American cemetery here at Foy. So after the war, uh, 2,700 Americans were buried uh, in, the, in the space behind me, plus an additional 8,000 Germans uh, were buried back here as well. Um, after the war, when the U.S. government was looking for sites for the permanent cemeteries, they deemed that this site would not be, this ground was not suitable for a permanent cemetery. Most of the remains, those that they could identify, were transferred to the Henri Chapelle American Cemetery. Uh, those where there were any questions about the identification were sent to the Ardennes American Cemetery in Belgium. So the ones who were buried here were sent to the two American cemeteries that were here. It's easy to read all the numbers of things like people that died, you know, the, and like all, all like the numerical statistics, but it's hard to actually put that into perspective of like the actual human lives that were impacted. You know, just seeing a number only means so much. Um, so I think that that sort of just honestly just brings me more questions than answers as to what was this really like, other than just seeing some plaque in a museum. When did they actually dig the holes? Because if they were like 12 hours, like they built trenches and holes and all that stuff. Like... As fast as they could when they arrived. I mean, there's no, there's no one answer to that. But no, as soon as you know this is going to be posi your position, you'd start digging. All right, my father, I, yes, I'm really, really old. My father was a World War II veteran. He served in the, in the Lorraine and the 7th Army. He never um, talked a lot about his military service like most veterans of the war. But the one thing he did talk about is he said the one thing the war taught him was how to dig. He said, I could dig really fast and really deep. <laughs> he said, I could dig all the way to China if I had to. <laughs> you know, I mean, that was, that was the only thing that went through these guys' minds was dig, dig, dig. Now, it is Bastonia. It is the 20th of December. It's snowing and that ground is frozen. Wow. You dug anyway. You found a way to do it. You found a way to do it. Easy Company's objective was the village of Foy, F-O-Y. So after they had cleared out the Bois Jacques in that direction, all right, they had to turn their attack north to where the Germans were. And the Germans were at the village of Foy. You see the first buildings there on the left-hand side. And just a little bit further down, you can still see a bit the top of a roof right there. That is where Foy was, all right? And Easy Company had to attack Foy, coming across this open field, basically 200 meters of open ground against a group of Nazis that had been there for effectively four weeks. But if there's one lesson I want you guys to take away from this today, all right, is, is these guys' death, you know, everybody that died here at the Battle of the Bulge, their death means absolutely nothing in and of itself. What their death means is whatever you decide it's going to mean. Remember that in World War I, 155,000 Americans died, okay? They're buried in one American cemetery in Belgium and about 16 American cemeteries in France, all right? They came to save Europe from tyranny, and 25 years later, that next generation just let it all disappear. Their lives meant absolutely nothing because Europe found itself under the jackboot of the Nazis. The thing that really stuck out to me the most was when we looked at the one monument with the Belgian and the American flag up at the field in that direction. And it specifically said that the deaths 
of the soldiers who died here only mean anything insofar as we make sure that nothing like this ever happens again. Nothing like this in terms of all the deaths that occurred and in terms of the large scale war as a whole. Mr. Ambassador, we're here in one of the great monuments here that is uh, dedicated to Bist in Bastogne to the Battle of the Bulge. Talk about being here and the, just having these monuments here to, to honor the American soldiers who were fighting here. Well, this is an extraordinary place. This, this monument was built by Belgians and it was built to honor all of the units that fought during the Battle of the Bulge where enormous casualties were taken. This was the biggest battle that the Americans fought during the Second World War. 75,000 casualties, 20,000 dead. And they were here for five weeks fighting furiously. And this was the last stop before on to Berlin. Had they not held, the Germans would have swept all the way to the sea and we would have been fighting for years more. This is not U.S. government paid for here. This is private citizens in Belgium that want to honor the American soldiers. How important is it to make sure we you know, continue to support the, the effort here for the monuments as well, even back home, that they're well, happier. It's, it's, it's incredibly important to me and I think to, to all of us Americans. The Belgians built this monument to Americans. Uh, we shared the losses during that incredible battle. And now it's up to Americans, I think, to help restore this, this monument to its original pristine condition. As you look out across the land here, around the monument, you still see the hills, you still see the battlefield, even just up the road here, you have some of the foxholes that they continue to maintain in the woods. It's an amazing experience to just be here and you really step back in time uh, to, to 44 or 45 uh, time period there. Well, and, and farmers keep digging up ordnance, keep finding pieces of metal and other uh, items that were part of the Second World War here in and around Bastogne. Uh, the history doesn't go away. And so we need to remember the past because by the same token, uh, Belgium was, was overrun in the last hundred years twice. And who knows, it could happen again. So we need to be very, very vigilant. And thank goodness for organizations like NATO, where the Americans, the Belgians, and 27 other nations work together to keep the peace. The thing I like to tell people in the public, all of our cemeteries are different, but they're all the same. They all have, you know, there's certain basic elements that go into every cemetery, a burial area, a map area, uh, a chapel, and uh, of course the landscaping you see. So those are, the, those are the broad strokes. But this cemetery is very unique among all the cemeteries because it served as the central identification point for the entire European theater of operations. But this is a very unique site for that reason and the identification work for uh, those who recovered throughout Europe lasted all the way until 1960. For those unfamiliar with the kind of the, how the war even worked in this region, there, there's a, uh, a, a percentage of people that are, are buried here uh, from one branch more than it more than others really. Well that's true and that goes directly to what uh, what I was referencing with the identification work because of course the uh, the fact of the matter is if you have a, a heavy bomber with a crew of 10 that blows up in the air or crash lands and it explodes on the ground you have body body parts that are scattered and they have to be recovered and then the work of trying to put them back together is what went on here for those 15 years so, uh, consequently, yes, you're right, we do have about 65% of uh, those that are buried here were Army Air, Army Air Corps and, and uh, you know, our present day U.S. Air Force. Now, this site here, you wrote a book that is included in this part. Talk about this story here. This is a very special story. I mean, we, we, we found a passing reference to it. We being myself and the archivist of our, of our organization uh, found a passing reference to it somewhere. And all we knew that there was a Gerald Sorensen buried somewhere in Gonsorn. And we didn't even know which cemetery. So we took, uh, we made the effort to, to track it down. And one day we came out here and visited. Um, the gates were closed. We almost had to climb over to get it to open. <laughs> and and the, we started working our way through the cemetery until we came across uh, the grave. And as you see across the grave, it says Gerald E. Sorensen, uh, USA, died for Belgium. 
And that struck a chord with me. I had to find out who this was all about and why, why he was buried here in Belgium. Surrounding him is other amazing stories, just the, the burials around as well. Yeah, absolutely. This is the city of Ganshorn, this, this plot is known as the uh, Palouse d'Anneau, the, 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 uh, the, the honored place in the cemetery, if you will. And on the right-hand side here, everybody on the right were uh, people who, uh, who were active in the Belgian resistance, who were murdered by the Nazis in the course of the war. And it's a, it's a very, each of these stories has something to tell. So I remember um, Jenny Bales, for example, was telling me about Mr. Brabant, who you see the, the photograph right there. He had two young children that he left behind. Um, and, but he nevertheless felt it his duty to, to fight against the Nazi, the Nazi oppression. And There's even additional uh, remains uh, that have been brought in as well in this section here. Exactly. There's a section here for, uh, from ashes from Dachau, the concentration camp in Dachau, were brought here uh, to, to commemorate, uh, of course, what happened in the East. The structure of this one is so different than any of the other hidden grave sites that we've been to so far. For each of the isolated graves, the Americans that are buried outside of the cemeteries are there for a variety of reasons. Uh, in the case of Gerald Sorensen, it was because he became friends with the Abales family. He sheltered in their Abales family home. He became part of the Abales family. The Abales, um, you know, so it was, it was natural that he would be buried in the cemetery. And as I said, the city, um, following the war, decided to turn this into the special place for their war heroes. The American soldiers who died in Belgium, and that were either from Belgium originally, or their families asked for their grave sites to not be moved, are located across the country just like after their first war in private cemeteries. Gilbert Malray was born in the United States of America, in Providence, Rhode Island, in fact, on the 7th of July, 1919. He was a native-born American. Uh, but his father, was Albert, was from here, the village of Ronza, the city of Ronza. And his mother, Anna, was of English birth. I found this coincidentally in a winter walk with my, my wife. We walked here on the cemetery, and I saw an American soldier buried in Ronza. When the Nazis invaded Belgium, Gilbert enlisted in the United States Army Air Forces and joined the aviation cadet program. So I started to find his family, why he is buried here in Ronson. So I found his family. His father lived just two meters, 300 meters from here. So Gilbert ended up becoming a navigator on a B-24 that was piloted by a, a person named Timus, a Lieutenant Timus. The family, they, they have nothing to no info, information, they just they know uh, he was to die in Romania, Romania, but how and where, he, they don't know. But on the 4th of April, 1944, their luck ran out. The squadron was sent on a mission to bomb railway, yard, railway yards in Bucharest, and in Romania. En route to the target, they were attacked by a group of 80 to 100 uh, German fighters. Uh, the the Timus crew was on the outside perimeter of that squadron. The fighters attacked him. The plane burst into flames, fell to the ground in Romania, and Gilbert was originally buried in Romania. Each grave service is unique. Each soldier's story is shared. The Belgian people carry on. It's their way to remember the past and keep driving towards the future. Americans also can help keep their legacy alive. Sentinelsofmemory.org is an online community that welcomes people around the world to honor Americans fallen or buried overseas. Thank you for joining us on this Situation Report. For more information, please visit our website, unctv.org veterans. Thank you.
Situation Report, Liberating Belgium, Remembering America's Sacrifice, is made possible by contributions from UNCTV, Public Media North Carolina members, and by the generous support of Louise Bennett. This program was produced by UNCTV, Public Media North Carolina, in partnership with the American Battle Monuments Foundation, the American Overseas Memorial Day Association Belgium, Visit Flanders, and the Wallonia Tourism Bureau.